Welcome everybody to Advising Hacks. Uh, I'm Matt Cheney, I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies, which lives here in the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University. And we are happy to welcome Kelsey Donnelly uh, to lead us through some exciting Advising Hacks. Kelsey, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Matt. I am Kelsey Donnelly. I am the Assistant Director of New Student Advising in the Center for Student Success. It's a long title, a lot to say. Um, I have been advising, this is my fifth year, so I've learned some tricks along the way that I kind of wanted to share. It might be too much, it might be not enough, so if anything pops up and you have questions, please feel free to ask. And also, please feel free to share. I am so looking for also like what others are doing to help make their advising sessions go smoothly and easily and their tricks of the trade. So if you have anything that you use regularly, please pipe in. I'd love to hear it. So I'm going to share my screen. Is it sharing? No. It is not. Hmm, so it's weird when I hit share screen. Try something different. There we go. All right, so I'm going to go into presentation mode. Do you see advising hacks on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, you're going to hear some background music because right outside my window there is a choral class going on. So we might have some background music totally planned. <laughs> so when we started these positions five years ago, the goal was to have a heavy focus on the whole student, not necessarily just academics and what they need to register and to make sure they're on track, but also like what's going on in their lives outside of the classroom, how things are going like mentally, emotionally, like within their res halls, um, what they're looking for with like, what are their career aspirations? What are some challenges that they've experienced where they've been here? What are some successes? So um, in a little bit, I'll give some prompting questions on how we can get you know, uh, get answers to those to get a good pulse check on how the student is doing. One of the goals of advisors is to be a referral agent. So you're usually the go-to person for students on campus. You're their, uh, their advisor, their guidance counselor, they're the person, you're that one like contact that they know that they can go to you and you can help them, maybe not directly, maybe more indirectly. You are a resource agent. So if you don't know the answer to something, you should be able to let students know who they need to go to. Um, our SharePoint site, which I'll show a little later, does have a pretty comprehensive list of the resources available on campus. So I'll show you that later on. Kelsey, should we be seeing your presentation mode or the back of PowerPoint? Because right now we're just seeing PowerPoint. You should be seeing my presentation mode. Okay. What do you mean you're just seeing PowerPoint? Uh, we're seeing the, the PowerPoint slides and the list of slides and all of that. Mm -hmm. Let me stop sharing. So it's odd when I hit share. Yeah. It, like, uh, let's see. Can you tell me what there you're There we go. That's what you want. Yeah. On the holistic advisor, that's kind of sorry about that. I don't. That's the mysteries of Zoom. <laughs> so now that you've seen all the slides, we can stop. <laughs> um, so yeah, like our goal is to be referral agents to help students figure out the resources they need. Um, and uh, another goal of advisors or holistic advisors is to help build confidence and help offer encouragement. That is one of the key points to relationship building. And once you build that rapport and that relationship with your advisees, they're going to open up. They're going to open up to what's actually going on and not the surface level conversations, but it's a good way to dig deeper into what's really going on in the lives of our students.
Can you see conversation starters? <laughs> I'm having some tech issues, so thanks for reassuring me. These are some things that I've learned early on that tend to break down the barrier of students when they're in my office. Again, I work mostly with first year students. So a lot of these might be geared towards them, but are totally tweakable to target your particular population. So like just my first one's like, how's your world? How is it going? How are classes? Anything gonna be a challenge? Are you behind in any classwork? How's dorm life? How's your roommates? Like asking these questions and really pausing to listen and knowing that you actually care about the answer. You hear some interesting stories. So I, I really encourage asking about what their life is like outside of the classroom. Like, what is their living situation like? Are they at home? Are they off campus? Is the roommate situation going okay? Um, are you eating is one that I have recently added into my list of questions because surprisingly, the answer is often no. So I kind of just asked directly, are you eating? Are you getting the food that you need? Are you happy with the dining hall? Just Asking those questions is, it's a good segue into some issues that might be going on that need to be addressed. When conversations stall and you're not really sure what else to go to, I will just pull out like, tell me something interesting about you. What was your life like before PSU? Because they all had this entirely different life that has nothing to do with here that totally contributes to who they are here. So kind of learning a little bit about their past really helps make us better advisors because we kind of know their interests and how to help serve them better. Uh, again, as a first year advisor, I want to know who's staying here on the weekends or who's calling home a lot. If they're calling home, if they're um, really, if they're missing home and they tend to go home every weekend. Those are kind of those like trigger points. Like we need to keep an eye on the student. We need to want to make sure that they try to build the community here and stay connected with people here. So we will go over see, some options. Yes. Can I, can I just add a little on that? I had a child who did not do well in college and just took three semesters to crash and burn, but it was happening the whole first three semesters. Um, and she did not call home at all. And she did not tell anyone she ha was having trouble. And if you asked her if she was okay, she would have always said yes. And I told her first year dean that. I was like, don't listen to her. Don't listen to her words. She will always tell you she's okay. Make her come out of her room and go to dinner. Yeah. And I knew they did that because I would sometimes be talking to her and she was like, oh, someone's here to ask me to dinner. How nice. I'm like, yes. But she did not call home. So sometimes calling home is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what your experience is. is you, you've talked to a lot more first year students, a lot more intimately than I do, but I just have this firsthand experience of a, of a student in real trouble who was not in touch at all. Right. Yeah, and it's definitely, there's going to be that spectrum of students, some that are really willing to keep us in the loop, to keep their family in the loop, and some that are going to be really reserved. It's kind of, you know, what's your spidey sense say? What's going on with the student? Is things exactly how you think they are, or do we need to dig deeper? Um, this is my favorite question. I ask it in almost every single advising appointment because it really it lets me know what's going well and it lets me know what's not going well on a scale from one to ten what is your experience at PSU so far and students will like think about it for a minute and then they'll throw out I'm like eh, seven all right that's not bad what would make it a ten and that's when we find out oh the dining hall could be better or my roommates are really loud at nighttime, or it's a lot more work than I thought it was gonna be. So that's when we know like, okay, well, have you thought of these resources? And let's think about doing this. That's where we can kind of target those pain points to help enhance their experience here. 
Does anyone want to offer some great questions that they ask in their advising sessions that might that we could add to the list? All right. So when I'm asking students those questions, like, what are you doing when you're not in the classroom? I do not want to hear that they are staying in their room playing video games. I would much rather hear that they are going to club meetings or going hiking with their friends. So if students don't really know how to get involved, I will ask like, do you even know what we offer? Do you know what clubs and organizations we offer here on campus? And a lot of the times they don't. So I will sit down with them and we'll look through the list together. I'm afraid to click on the link because I don't know how it's gonna work with screen sharing, but here is a link to our clubs and our orgs and there's a lot and there is almost always something that interests somebody. We have a hammock club, like, who doesn't want to go hang out in hammocks? <laughs> we have some really cool clubs. So just going through that list together with students is a good way to like let them really see what's going on. Some will be like, no, I didn't make it to the activities fair. It's totally fine. That's not your only way of figuring out what's available. So check out this list and it's really, it's, it's low risk. So you click on the, clubs, you find one like, yeah, I want to join the hammock club. You click a button that says find more information and you put in your name and email and they'll reach out to you. So that's all they have to do. They don't have to blindly show up to a meeting that they don't know anybody just to get more information. All they have to do is send a quick email. So that is something that I do often, especially with first years who I need to make sure are involved on campus. What are your career goals? The, a big part of these positions is to integrate career a lot more. Get them thinking early on about what they're doing here does have an impact on their employment later on. That's one of the main reasons students come to school. Not the only one, but it is a main reason. They want to get a good job. So this is something that I have learned, this is how I explain it to students that don't seem to want to get involved at all. They just want to focus on their academics. And I will say, okay, so in four years, you're going to graduate from PSU with a degree in criminal justice. That is awesome. But there's a lot of people in the criminal justice major. So you all are going to be graduating at the same time and you're going to be applying for the same jobs. So if I was an employer and I had this stack of resumes and the first one, he came to Plymouth State and he has a degree in criminal justice. Awesome. My next one, he came to Plymouth State and he has a degree in criminal justice, but he was also on the volunteer club and he studied abroad. And then the last person, she went to PSU and she has a degree in criminal justice and she was on the um, volunteer club and she also had a leadership um, role on campus and she studied her broad her some sophomore year. What, if you're looking at all three of these resumes, which one are you going to pull in? So obviously I'm going to take the one that has more involvement on campus. So that is just a way, I think, to make students a little like grasp, oh, I really do need to get involved. I can't just go to school. It really does look good to get involved. It looks good to your employer and it really helps with the connections here on campus. Um, another thing when it comes to career, um, we have focus to, oops, we have focus two, which is an assessment that students can take. It is linked to our majors here at Plymouth State. So they can take it and they can put in their hobbies and their interests and their passions and they, they put it all together and then they spit out, well, like this could be a possible 
um, profession for you and you can get there by taking this major that we offer here at Plymouth State. So it is something especially good for undeclared students, but any student just kind of like they know the major, but they don't necessarily know the degree focus that or the employment focus that they want to go on. Focus two is a really good way to help narrow that down. Um, talking minors. So most majors have a significant amount of electives that they can use in their minor. So I mean in their with their major. So a lot of the times it's smart to focus those electives on a minor. So that was actually part of my resume example. This one as a degree in criminal justice and a minor in coaching and you know and then also did all of the other stuff. It just makes you more marketable. We as first years and also in our office we have two advisors that focus on sophomore undeclared students. We walk students through major changes quite a bit. I learned when I first started this role that most incoming students are functionally undeclared. They some have a definitive idea of the major and they start doing it and they're like nope this isn't it. So we stop and we pivot and we help talk them through something else. But I just encourage everybody to you know be open when they have come to you and they have said I want to change my major they didn't come to that conclusion in the last 30 seconds. They had been thinking about it and they've been probably talking to home and they're ready to do it. So just help them through the process of the major change um, to help if they're an undeclared student, give some options of some classes that might be good for them to test out if they're still not sure and it's okay. Let them know that it's okay to change your major. There's only one way to figure out if the major is the right fit and that's to actually start taking classes in that major. So you start taking classes in that major. It doesn't work. It's okay. We stop. We pivot. We find something else. That is the whole point of college is to explore your options and to find what really resonates most with you. Um, I will meet with students if they're like, I don't, I don't want this major anymore. I really want something else. I will sit down with them and I will go through the catalog. I'll go through the majors one by one. And I'll say, if there is something that sounds even a little bit interesting, I want you to let me know. And then we'll click on that major and we'll dive a little deeper. Like, do these courses sound interesting to you? And usually you can gauge by their energy level what excites them a little bit more. And so that's just a sign that that's a direction that we should investigate. Um, if they you go through the catalog and there just isn't anything that excites them, my next and favorite place to send them is to the Interdisciplinary Studies website. They have hundreds of options that students have created all on their own by parts of majors that we have. So maybe a student like doesn't love one thing, but they tie a whole bunch of things together to make their own. And they have, I would love to show it to you, but again, I'm scared to switch screens. I'll put it in uh, the chat. <laughs> what? You're gonna put it in the chat? I'll put it in the chat in a moment. Thank you. Matt, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about it because you are the expert, but it's just phenomenal. Like, especially like the the sheets and then the breakdowns of the classes that those students have taken. I've had some good success with that. Yes. So um, you can find it on the CoLab website for folks who are seeing the um, the recording of this. It's under um, IDS on the COLA, Interdisciplinary Studies on the CoLab website and then Sample Programs. Um, and this way you can see the various kinds of majors we've created in the past. Um, this is drawing from the past five years or so. Um, some of which now are actual majors. So this isn't necessarily a tool that you have to use um, only if students are going to become IDS majors. Um, you can instead see all the different ways that, that people have mixed and matched things, um, which may give your students some, uh, some ideas about um, 
paths that they could follow. Um, but things like child life specialty, now that lives within uh, youth development as an actual major. Um, one of the things we try to be at um, in IDS is a kind of uh, bellwether to see what's going, what sorts of things students are looking for, and then we get enough of them, and that can begin to suggest new majors um, within programs that already exist, which is much easier than doing an IDS major. Thanks, Matt. So any questions up until here that I can help answer? So this helping students through academic difficulty, I actually just added the slide just because it's pretty much my world right now. Five week grades just came out and we do a pretty deep review of how students are doing. We actually get a list of like what their GPA would look like right now if the semester were to end. And there's a lot on the lower spectrum that they would, you know, if the semester were to end right now, these students would be separated from the university or they'd be put on probation. And we really don't want that. Their foundation of the classes that they've taken so far is pretty low, but there's still time to build on that and to turn things around. So I think to help students, one is to actually just look at their five week grades. If there's anything concerning, please reach out to those students, get them in your office. If you reach out by email and they don't respond, I'm not sure if anyone uses Navigate, but if you do, you can actually just book an appointment for them to get them in. You can see a time that they don't have class and it doesn't conflict with anything that you have on your schedule. It will give open times that's available for both you and the student. And you can just set the appointment up and they'll get emails and they'll get text messages. And we've had really good luck with doing that. Um, just They'll just show up. I would say like 80%, someone in our office says about 80% of the students that she booked appointments for came, which is really good turnaround. And I think a lot of it does have to do with that text reminder that they get. Also, um, around five week grades, we also got these alerts from student, um, from athletics. Anybody who is a student athlete became um, wasn't doing well in a class. As advisors, we get alerts on those students. And I encourage everybody to reach out to those students. That means something's not not going well and we need to intervene as early as possible. Um, a lot so of the time, a, yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Go for it. Um, so I have advisees who also have a success coach. Yeah. First year advisees. Um, I don't want to inundate them with the same questions, you know, or, um, and so I, I mean, I've, I've already, Brianna and I are talking a little bit, but if I have a, I have a first year advisee that I'm particularly concerned about and I have him in class and stuff, but his five week grades were like horrible. Um, so I, like, I don't, what's our role? I guess that's my question. What's our role for first year advisees where they also have a success coach? I, you know, I, this was mentioned in the last session, but I think you just need to find, like, let the student decide if, you know, one, repetition is never a bad thing. I think asking these same questions again means there's multiple people out there that care about what's going on, multiple people that want to help. I think if you are in a capacity to ask those questions to the student, please feel free. Don't worry about, like, this is, this is our role right now as advisors. It doesn't matter if you're a success coach or a faculty advisor, you are the support person for that student in that moment. And I think do whatever you can to help triage what's going on. They might connect with you better than the success coach or you're there right now. So that's one of the things that I actually say to students as well is you know, you haven't heard from the semester student all semester, and then they're here to get their pin and they have straight F's. And you want to be like, why haven't you answered my outreaches? But you can't because that's going to shut them down. You need to take the mentality is you're here now. It's okay. You're here now. Let's start where we are and see how we can move forward. So I don't think you should think about that too much. I think you should give all the love and assistance you can when they're in front of you. 
Well, so Brianna is going to help them with their spring schedule. So I was thinking I would try and kind of hit the next week. Um, I don't have in my advising um, list anybody's pin or web reg date. Is that just me? Anybody does yet? Okay. I don't think they've hit yet. Okay. That's kind of weird though. It feels kind of belated because I would normally triage my students based on when their web reg date is. Mm -hmm. I think they'll be out by this afternoon. I know they're supposed uh -huh. to release today. Today's the release date. They just haven't come out yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, like if we have straight Fs, there's something else going on. Or if they have really, really low grades, that's something I say straight out in my email. I'm like, I can see your grades. I can tell you're not doing well. And usually, you know, when I see grades like this, it means something else is going on. Is everything okay? It is, a, you know, we need to dig deeper and see what else is going on? Because if they have so many outside stressors, they're not going to be able to focus on academics anyway. So maybe that's what we need to be triaging, not necessarily how, be, why their grades are so low, but how can we, you know, help support them so they can focus on their grades. Um, in these meetings with students, once they do connect with me for five week grades, I will say like, let's meet, we need to meet weekly, we need to meet bi-weekly. And in those meetings, we'll come up with goals. We'll come up with one to three goals of things they need to focus on in that week. We break it down to bite-sized pieces, things that are manageable and that they can easily check off a list just so they feel like they're getting some momentum. A lot of the time, one of those goals is you need to reach out to every single one of your professors and you need to ask what you're missing. What what assignments are you late on? Are you able to make up these assignments? Do you think I'll be able to pass this class? Sometimes asking those forward questions needs to happen because there's a good chance that they haven't been communicating with their faculty member up until this point. So encouraging those reach outs is a very good thing. I always say CC me on the email so I can see the response. I have a few students that I'm doing this with right now I'm like, okay, by the end of today, I want you to make a list of all the assignments that you're late on and I want you to send it to me. I want you to send me a list of all your assignments and then each one you do, I want an email. I want you to say, I completed this assignment. I completed this assignment. Sometimes students just need that extra layer of accountability to help get them through it and they do it. It's Some don't, but I do have students that will actually send me the list of assignments and let me know when they're getting stuff done. And then I can respond with, you know, a note of encouragement and to keep them going. Or if I don't see anything, I can ping them like the next day saying, I didn't see any assignments. How did it go? Just to keep that conversation moving forward. Um, we talked about this earlier. If they have to withdraw from a class, looking into the past semester courses is a really good way to help make up the credits. And this question I ask, it's, it's pointed, but sometimes it needs to be said. Who do you want to make proud? Instead of why are you here, it's who do you want to make proud? And a lot of the time you'll hear that it's, you know, it's their mom who worked three jobs so they could be here. And then I had to follow up with like, how's the conversation going to go when you tell her that you you didn't do so well and that you actually have to come home next semester. So that question hits home a lot and it, I think, you know, breaking them down to that point a little bit, seeing like these future conversations that has to happen, has to happen, will help propel them forward a little bit. I also okay, encourage I them to that. talk to home too about where they're at. I have another question. Yeah. I feel as though there are limits to my mandate as a professor and as a faculty advisor. I feel like there's some boundaries and that question probably is going to make them cry. And I don't know if that's really my role, <laughs> whereas it may be a success coach's role a little bit more. So I guess I wonder how you feel about professors or faculty asking questions that are p pushing a little bit more for an emotional response. You know? I, I don't know. I just go back to like advising the whole student. And 
life is emotional. And I think, you know, getting to those emotions sometimes is the barrier that needs to be broken. If you personally are not comfortable with those conversations, don't ask them, don't, don't force them. But if you are comfortable in having them, I definitely encourage them. Matt, what do you think? I feel like you have an opinion. <laughs> I saw, yes, I saw one in your face. I do. I, I don't think that, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that if you're comfortable with it. I think that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, there are students I'm very comfortable having that sort of more personal conversation. There are students who clearly it, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and so I've, I trust that instinct as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, eliminating judgment. This wasn't on my slide, but it, I, there was my first year here, I was, it was registration time and the student had to come get their pin and I had been emailing like severely like trying to get in contact with this student and nothing. And he shows up the last day of registration and I'm like, what, what are you doing? Where have you been? And that's when I learned that his house burned down and his family just made it out and he lost all his pets. And I'm like, whew, okay. And that's where the you're here now, like mentality came through. I'm like, you have a lot going on. It's I, you know, you just never know what has been happening up until this point. So it's easy for us to, I don't know, it can be, it can be easy to see the very low grades and think that they don't care. But what I have found is that most likely is not the case, that there's just a lot more going on. And one of the things I really like about the advisor role is that I'm not grading them. I don't have to judge. You know? <laughs> and so for them to have somebody in their life who's in that position can be really valuable. Good point. Um, I, I told you we come up with three goals for the week. Um, a lot of the time, one of those is to encourage the student to contact the counseling center. Um, when you dig deeper and you find out more stuff's going on, that is a big resource that I refer students to. And obviously, like seeing a tutor for the academic pieces is huge as well. So I, I have heard, like, I do not deal a lot with financial advising. Um, usually when it's those higher level conversations, I refer them to the student financial services and they can talk about their bill and their financial aid and all things that, but sometimes it does integrate into my conversations, especially right now when like five week grades came out, they're not doing well, there's no way they can pass this class and we have to withdraw them. So if they withdraw now, they still have the option of picking up a half semester course. But after the 16th, if they withdraw from this class because there really is no way for them to recover, then there's nothing else they can do to help pick up the slack. So this is how I kind of lay it out to them. I'm like, okay, you can withdraw from this class, but you need to know that you do need to average 15 credits a semester in order to graduate on time. If we drop this class now, you have to retake it, especially if it's a class for your major. So you have to take retake this class. Therefore, you're already paying for it twice. And when you retake this class, it's gonna leave a void in your schedule. So you have to take another class on top of it. So technically, this one class, you have to pay for three times. So that hits home a lot with students when you put that financial like layer on it and they'll some will be like okay i'm gonna talk to my professor i'm really gonna try to turn things around it's sometimes students just need to hear it broken down like that i do always say that a w looks better on a transcript than an f um, a w will just show that you attempted it you just didn't complete it but it won't impact your gpa um you know half semester courses always a good option satisfactory academic progress this is a term that I didn't know about my first couple years of advising. It really didn't start until like two years ago and it became like a, a big deal. So students need to 
in order to go to school, a lot of them are taking financial aid and they need to prove to the government that they're completing 67% of their classes in order to continue to get that aid because no one's going to give money to someone to just like, you know, keep withdrawing or keep failing classes. So they need to prove that they're actually making satisfactory academic progress. If students do withdraw from a lot of courses or they do fail a lot of courses, they will have to appeal in order to keep their financial aid over the summer. So that is something that is worth making sure the students are aware of. If you want to have a deeper conversation with that, Marianne Turner in our office runs that process and she's really knowledgeable about it. So you could reach out to her, but it is a smart move to make sure the students are aware that this is happening. So sometimes you can withdraw from a class and you feel great about that. Oh, that stress and anxiety is off my shoulders. And so you want to withdraw from another one, but that that compounds and it leads to not only do you have to pay for more classes and extra time, you could be looking at losing your financial aid. Um, and just an oops, another thing to keep in mind, credit wise, they want to make sure they get zero to 30 credits to be considered a first year, 30 to 60 to be considered a sophomore, 60 to 90 to be a junior, and a senior is 90 plus. So if they don't hit those benchmarks, like if they are a first year student and they didn't average 15 credits each semester, they're not going to be considered a sophomore next year. And that could impact their financial aid. It could impact their financial, I mean, their registration dates. It just could have some continuing impact. So really encouraging that 15 to finish 15 every semester is a really good thing to keep an eye on. Any questions with this? I know that was a lot. So keeping the students in the loop, I, one of the things as a success coach I do and we all do is we email out to the students weekly just to keep us on their radar, to let us know that we're still here and we still have advice to give and there's lots of stuff that you don't know. So here's some stuff to just to keep in mind. I think it's important for all advisors to do this to reach out early and often to your advisees. I still have, right now I have a lot of sophomores like reaching out and being like, I don't, I don't know who my advisor is. Um, so a lot of the times students don't necessarily hear from their advisor until registration weeks, but I would strongly encourage everybody to reach out early in the beginning of the semester. Just introduce yourself, let you know, let them know your availability, how to reach you if they have anything that comes up. And though you will be meeting with them during registration weeks, I think just knowing that you're available throughout the whole year is very important. Kelsey, have you found any good tricks to do this during the era of Zoom? Because I have found this term that I'm not as good at this as I used to be because I used to rely so much on students coming by the office. And mm -hmm. I spent lots of time hanging around the office for students. Right, so I guess what I have been doing <laughs> is not only have I been emailing out, we will send random text check-ins through Navigate to see how they're doing. It's amazing how they'll ignore email, ignore email, but as soon as you send a text, they will engage in conversation. Or also, and Matt, you probably do this anyway because you make great videos, put a little video in your email. So that actually puts a, face and a voice to the words that are being said. So they might have a little more comfort level to come visit you. Any that's other tips? Great. from? That's yeah. a great idea. I hadn't actually thought of making a quick video for simple conversations like this, but that makes a lot of sense. What do you all do? Anything to keep students in the loop? Just that's why I'm here. Else. What did you say, Vince? I said I just send emails. I'm sorry. Somebody, oh, okay. So I apologize. No apology needed. One thing you mentioned um, social media pages on there, Kelsey, and that made me think of we have a program um, 
Twitter account and we have a program Facebook and we use both of those for sort of general announcements and just, you know, things of interest and it doesn't reach tons of students, but it does reach some and continues to, to allow a sense of community, especially these days. True. Matt, do you have a sense of whether students are more engaged with Twitter or more engaged with Facebook? I, my sense is students are more engaged with Instagram and I'm not on there. Yeah. So <laughs> it's my own fault. Yeah. I think well, that's one of our big thrusts this fall is we're going to make an Instagram. Um, yeah. So I, but I'm always surprised how much you guys use Facebook and, and you do seem to get responses that way, which I, I thought it was only like for Aunt Gertrude now, but yeah, not, it depends. Um, and it is mostly for Aunt Gertrude, um, <laughs> but uh, places like if, if people know that it is a useful place, they'll go to it. So I think this is why the English department has really the star Facebook page. Um, because English just has built up over the years a real culture of we're going to use our Facebook page for community. IDS isn't really there yet, but we keep trying. <laughs> I know students in my class are all into Snapchat. They all have this big like group chat going. Never used it. No idea how, but it seems like if you wanted to investigate how to get to their level, Creating a Snapchat might be it. <laughs> yes, that's been on my top list of things to investigate when we're not in a global pandemic and I actually have time. Yes. <laughs> Kate Elvey has a, Kate Elvey uses Snapchat to reach her students. She just asks them, what's the best way? And they're like, Snapchat, she's like, okay, here I go. But um, any sense of whether a Facebook group or a Facebook page is better? Because we have a group, but we don't have a page. And Morgan Navarro just explained to me that maybe we want to switch it but i don't want to do that more than once so right i think um we've been using groups rather than pages i think groups allow better engagement from a variety of people pages are more like information coming from one section so we did just do a degree work video um, and session and all of this was posted in there. So I know Vince, you saw it. Becky, you're probably pretty fluent with degree work. So I'm going to just skim through this slide really quick. Video will be available for anybody who wants it. Perfect. So uh, we use degree works often. I say to the student, this is a layout of the classes that you need to take and a checklist of the ones that you need to take that you have taken just to make sure you're on track to graduate in four years. So it's a good way to see what they are missing, what they need for their major. You can do a quick view of the classes that are available. You can see your current GPA. You can see the minors that you're in now, which is a cool enhancement to degree works because you weren't always able to do that. So I'm excited that minors are now in degree works. Are they all there? I thought that they were building them up sort of bit by bit. I've been seeing them. I can't say one way or the other whether they're all there. I just know I've been seeing them pop up. Oops. Oh no, my mouse has this thing where it likes to just die every once in a while. So this is my last slide and I'm gonna let you look at it real quick and then I'm going to show you what I'm talking about when I say email templates and when I say the advisor tab and fast email responses and bookmarks and navigate appointments. Oh, my mouse is not going to work, so it's going to be more challenging. Okay, so now I am going to, uh oh, there's lots in the chat. Am I missing something? Nope. Okay, okay. so let's what do i want to show you first i want to show you email i want to show you email hacks email templates because someone showed me this and okay i'm going to show you my screen no judgment on my inbox <laughs> okay so Let's see if I can just open it. Do you see my email? Yes. Yeah, okay. So 
email templates. I get asked the same question over and over. It's just, it just happens. So I have been told of this cool thing called my templates. And I can put in responses to my most commonly asked questions and I can respond this way. Right now, a big one that I've been asked is change of major. So I'm going to click on the change of major um, email. I have mine dark, so I always have to do this to get it all in there. But so here is the form that they have to fill out and the process they have to fill the form out. It is a paper form. It's a fill in PDF. So it's a bit, the process is a bit clunky. The students have to make sure that they download the PDF to their desktop, fill it out from their desktop, save it, and then email it to the registrar's office. So I try to get that information in here. In the change of major form, you need to know who the coordinator is of that major so they can sign off on it. So in my email template, I put this little note just for me that links to the chairs and the program coordinators. This one's old, it's for spring 20, but I can click on this and it's going to pop up and it's going to tell me, oh, well, for social work, you need to contact this person. And it gives me the email right there. So I'm going to put that contact and email right into these parentheses. And then I just remove this bottom um, line so the student doesn't see it. It's just a quick way for me to respond to students and find who the contact is because I don't have all of them memorized. So that is email hacks. I mean, that is email templates. And I'm just going to keep stop sharing and then resharing because changing screens when you share sometimes messes things up. The next thing I'm going to show you, it's something I use so often. It's my quick email responses. I have it on a sticky note. You could have it on a Word document. You can have it on anything, but here we go. So I don't know about you, but I've been spending a lot of time on Zoom and I just want a quick way to get there. So I put my Zoom link on top. A lot of students ask questions about student financial services and I just have the email there or campus accessibility services, just my quick like contact information that student needs. So I don't need to go look it up in a bunch of different places. I just have it all in one spot. You can make this specific to you and the questions that you have to answer. For me, this has just been really it has helped expedite my email response time. That's for sure. And you keep this on a sticky note? I keep mine on a sticky note. I have like transferred it to a word that I could share out as well. But um, again, it's really like questions that you have to answer often, things that come across your radar. It, it, this has helped me. So thought I would just share that. couple other things and then we're running out of time but almost done i do have a two o'clock so but. okay likewise awesome almost done so sharing my screen one more time this link is new and the advising task force over the summer worked with IT to get this up and running. So there's now an advising tab on the top of my Plymouth. The goal of this is to get resources for students and advisors readily accessible so you can get to it quickly. There is a tab specifically for um, faculty and staff advisors, and there's a tab specifically for undergraduate students. I'm going to select the faculty and staff. Am I sharing my screen? <laughs> so this is our PSU for advisors. Um, I, I use advisor resources a lot. I'm not going to go too in depth over this site, but 
check it out. There is a lot of information. There's information on, you know, if your advisee is an athlete and some things you need to keep in mind about that. Navigate, which I can't encourage enough everybody to start utilizing. There is this whole resource pool of like how to's and videos on how to get things up and running and how to use that. Some general advising resources, again, things that I use or advisors use often with advising students. There's quick links here, like that list of clubs and orgs I mentioned earlier. You can find that here. You can get to Degree Works here earlier. Plymouth Academic Support Services. We just have some quick links, quick links here. Whoops. Um, so one thing with this tab, I'm going to go back and click on it again. Right now, during advising time, we as success coaches, we use this a lot. Everything isn't pulling up. So I'm going to go. So this spring 2021 course registration seats. We've created these for first year students, but please take a look. Feel free to expand on them to help you in your advising sessions in any way. I do find that they help um, go over advising with our students. They make the process go easier. So um, let's see, I'm going to select, sorry, I am using my keyboard mouse and it is making things weird. Let's say exercise and sports physiology. This is the sheet that we would use. So a student would use this in conjunction with DegreeWorks. They would open up DegreeWorks and they'd fill out their name, if they have any minors, the amount of credits that they're already enrolled in, again, just to keep track to make sure that they are on track to graduate on time. They use this as a checkoff list, like have they taken composition, have they taken stats, have they taken a wicked problem. If they haven't taken any of these first year requirements, um, they can put them down here on this worksheet, the course ID, the title, the CRN, because right now it's advising weeks and we're just browsing classes. But when it comes time to actually go and register, you're going to want all of this information all in one spot. So this is a good way to put their CRNs and the classes and the times. Kelsey, what, where, who made those? I've never seen that before. Those, it's like the old curriculum planning guides that we were told they weren't making anymore. Someone made them. We've been using these since year one because we have found that they help us. Yeah, but where, where, where did they come we, from? We made them. You made them. Mm -hmm. We weren't told that anybody was ever going to make those again. Well, they're just for us. We have them specific. They're just year one and year two. I see. Okay. Um, wow. I link, we link to the catalog on here. So if they want the full four year breakdown, they can do that. Again, if you wanted to take these sheets and include your three and your four for your purposes, go for it. Yeah, thank you. That's fantastic. I'm really happy to know that exists. Great. I, you know, I wish I'd known sooner, but there it is. And then usually in the forms, um, if a program has like a four year block plan or a curriculum plan all broken out, I try to attach that to the registration sheet as well, just so they have all of the information all in one spot. I work with the programs to get this information. Okay, so my predecessor just didn't tell me, I guess, that because I'm a program coordinator now, but I wasn't until last fall. So, right. I literally didn't know this existed. Okay. But good. So, yeah, I know I am running out of time. Does anyone have any questions or anything I didn't touch on? I know I'm going to run, but thank you so much for this. This is really helpful. Great. I'm glad. Really thank you. It. No problem. <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Vince. Are you feeling any more confident for next week? I actually feel a lot more confident. Good. Maybe not confident. <laughs> I feel better. You could do it. a lot better. Um, I appreciate the help. So thank you guys. Really, like reach out anytime. It. I'm not kidding. If you have any more questions, like even if like one off questions, feel free. I'm here. Perfect. Okay. I will take you up on that offer. Thank you. You should. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. Bye. Nice to meet you. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, thanks for visiting, uh, viewing this. Guess what?